special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. I know this is going to sound weird to say, but I'm absolutely grateful grateful that I had this opportunity to be a rare disease family, to be a rare disease dad. It really opened my eyes and it actually changed me. You know, you I would say that sobriety changed me, but dude, having a rare disease while in sobriety completely changed me even more to where you like you have this affinity, this open world view of everything. Hi and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad-to-dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Chris Valona of North Los Angeles, the father of two and founder of the Project Sebastian, a not-for-profit named after his oldest son. Chris, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Thank you for having me, David. Happy to be here. It's about time. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. So you and your former wife, Teresa, were married for 10 years and are the proud parents of two boys, Gage, 16, and Sebastian, 18, who was diagnosed with Batten disease. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. Grew up in San Fernando Valley inside Los Angeles, California. Born in 1969, September 5th. Hello, fellow Virgos. And basically just had a great childhood from what I remember. I am the youngest of four children. There was six of us total, great family. I have two older brothers and one older sister. Excellent. So I'm sort of curious to know, what does your dad do for a living? Well, before he passed away, which was a year ago, last April, he was retired as a businessman. He retired from uh, television and radio for a better part of 40 years in Los Angeles, running such stations as RKO, Channel 9, and KDOC here in Los Angeles and Orange County. So he's a media guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's one of the reasons, not the ultimate, but one of many reasons why we have localized, televised sporting programs. So he was one of those innovators. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. So I'm sort of curious to know, how would you describe your relationship with your dad? Oh, he's, he's a great guy. I really miss him. Pretty much laughed every time we talked just was a very caring and loving man, but, uh, you know, <laughs> those Italians, iron fists. So uh, really shaped my life uh, um, after my uh, 26 years of, uh, you know, being in this world. Uh, I got sober, and he was actually one of my mentors in helping me stay sober. He uh, passed away with 40-plus years of sobriety. So, yeah, I miss that guy. He's a good dude. Chuck Valona it was his name. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Um, I'm sort of curious to know if there were an important takeaway or two that uh, comes to mind when you think about your dad, either the role model that he was as a father or something that really impacted you. He was always very supportive, but he was very realistic. Like, you know, I I told him I, I wanted to be this actor and I wanted to be in television and film and you know, this guy who, who did a lot of stuff in, in local TV basically would tell you that he hated the business. And so he kept every, everybody away, the family, from getting into the business. He firmly hated nepotism. And I would have to say that he, he was very uh, just reality-based. I tell him I wanted to be in the business, and he says, quit dreaming. Go get a real job, you know. You know, the world needs ditch diggers too, son. <laughs> and that was the one thing. He, but, you know, like any other father, he's just trying to protect me from, you know, the perils of, you know, crazy-ass dreams like we all have. And later on when we became friends, you know, because you're never really supposed to be friends with your father. But I was lucky. I got to be friends with my dad, and uh, we became best friends once I got sober. And you know, he told me these, you know, 
you know, he goes, you know, I love you, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I love you. And he said, no, no, I, you know, sorry if I was such a bad father, you know. And I said, you weren't a bad father. And he says, well, I just, you know, wanted to protect you and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it now because I have two kids, you know. He says, ah, that's, that's usually what happens. You know, you never really understand until you're a father yourself. So, I mean, great cheerleader, great mentor. He never, he never said don't. He just said, do your research. Interesting. So you mentioned in a previous conversation that after your dad passed, that you were provided with this coin that he had, which is the Rule <laughs> of 62 coin. What's the backstory on that? Well, screw anonymity, I guess. So uh, Rule 62 is, is, a, is a reminder. It's a, it's a coin. It says Rule 62. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. We're not a glum lot. And that's a daily reminder you know, for, for being in, in, you know, recovery that you're, you're not, you're not, you're not as important as you say you are, <laughs> you know, we're, we are a group mentality. We're not individualized. And basically you're to, to understand that you're part of a team and you're not this, you know, I need all this attention and crap like that, you know, because that usually leads to relapse. <laughs> so <laughs> we think we're the most important person in the room that, you know, we usually don't see those guys after a while. But yeah, that was a, a nice little gift, you know, from my from my father via my oldest brother at his funeral. So yeah. Yeah, well thanks for sharing. Very profound. Were there any other father figures, uncles, priests, coaches, anybody like that that had an influential role in your life? Uh, you know, I I got along with my uncle Jerry, my father's brother, Uncle Jerry. And you know, he was really a cool cat. He's still around. You know, he always playing the drums. So we we have we're a family of musicians, and it goes way back to to Sinatra. And everybody has a little bit of lineage that even some of my distant cousins are still playing music today, and quite quite enjoying them online and stuff like that. But you know, I it was a, it was a close knit between these these three families. You know, it was Uncle Al, it was Uncle Jerry, and then there was my brothers. I mean, I I really enjoy reminiscing about those men because. We were always at their house, either for Sunday dinner or we were at Fourth of July in uh, Simi Valley, and you know it was a great it was a great time being a child in the seventies. To be honest with you, a shout out to your uncle Jerry. I, out of curiosity, when you finished your education at Arizona State, you took a BA in broadcasting journalism. Where did your career take you? <laughs> it didn't go very far. <laughs> Sorry. So, you know, we talk about that, that whole, like, I, I am so popular. I'm so awesome. I'm just, I am the king. You know, I came out of college, just, you know, that mentality. I was going to be the youngest producer in Hollywood and eventually got fired from Warner Brothers and drank up those jobs and was really into my disease of drinking at that time and just bouncing around from television show to different production companies. And just, I was an idiot complete idiot. You know, I did shit I wasn't supposed to do and I never listened and I rarely showed up and then I wondered why I, I was fired. It was uh, not a not a a great time. I was having a great time, but you know, looking back on it, I was just it was embarrassing. <laughs> you know, this is just what this is what we do when we're we're drunks. We just we think everything's fine. I'll just find another job, you know. Couch surfing, getting kicked out of, you know, my family's houses and ruining relationships and yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't that great of a time until actually I got sober. Then then the real career began. So what was that then? I washed cars. I was a car washer. I finally found something that I enjoyed because I could be by myself, take all of those those hobbies that I learned through my uncles about cleaning cars and make some money on it. So I had a I had I had a standalone hand car wash in a detail shop in Montrose, California. And it was great. I was by myself. I got to listen to no one except me, and I made a few bucks. That's fabulous. One of my sons, my younger son, Dave, when he was in high school, I think, he always took an interest in cars, and he was like super neat neck about things. And people knew that about him, so he created a business called Davo's Detailing. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, you know, Dave, if you're smart about this, you would hire other people to do the detailing 
right? Pay them like 10 bucks an hour, which is a lot more money than they were earning yeah. at the time. And, you know, you keep the difference and you manage your relationships. And I think he just loved the detailing so much. <laughs> Yeah. It just was like a more, more modest business than it probably could have been. But yeah. you know, I can relate to what you're saying. For sure. I'm sort of curious to know, as we switch gears and talk about special needs, I'm sort of curious to know before Sebastian's diagnosis, did you or Teresa have any exposure to the world of special needs? No, not to special needs. I mean, you, you saw a few families around town and you kind of knew that that was, you know, this. forgive me, this is before my you know, education in this world. That was the different family, you know, that they were the weird, you know, whatever. But I always had compassion. I was like, wow, that must suck. And it was, it was not, not so much challenging as it was. I just didn't understand it and I didn't have to deal with it. So I you know, didn't give two shits about it, to be honest with you. But I was aware of it. I mean, you, you, you grow up in these, you know, I never had any neighborhood friends or any kids, but it was like when you're around the adults and you and you see these these parents you know that's what was really scary you know watching them and you didn't know what to do for them or how to even treat them so you just kind of was like yeah i gotta go <laughs> you know? yeah well i think to a lot of people if i can paraphrase what you've said it's a little bit of a out of mind out of sight out of mind and yeah. uh, you know if you don't have any direct connection or exposure it's really hard to appreciate or understand what's going on and uh mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable around people that are different. It's not being judgmental. It's just it's, maybe it's human nature. Yeah. Now I, I, I gravitate toward those families. You know, I see a kid in a wheelchair. Or you see a kid who can't talk or see. And you're like, hey, come here. I got you. you know, let's talk. And it's a, it's, it's a completely different mindset. And, uh, you know, I, I know this is going to sound weird to say, but I'm absolutely grateful grateful that I had this opportunity to be a rare disease family, to be a rare disease dad. It really opened my eyes and it actually changed me. You know, you, I would say that sobriety changed me, but dude, having a rare disease while in sobriety completely changed me even more to where you like, you have this affinity, this open world view of everything, everything. And you're like, what? What's going on right now? What else do I have to look forward to? I mean, what else are you going to put on my plate? And now I just say, bring it. Just bring it. I got you. I'm ready. You know, I'm tired, David, but I'm ready. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. So what is Sebastian's diagnosis, and um, how did that diagnosis come about? So Sebastian is uh, diagnosed with Batten disease. That's B-A-T-T-E-N CLN8, Batten disease, CNL8. So uh, there are so many numbers of this same disease in each variant has its own code. And so they name them by numbers. So it always goes CNL1, two, three, you know, on and on and on. I think it's up to like 12 or even, you know, there's a couple new ones. Uh, it's always, you know, the data is always coming in. So we used to say there's 13 known variants. There's probably maybe one or two more at this point. Uh, we're in 2021. So um, he uh, was finally diagnosed through uh, genetic testing after being diagnosed or misdiagnosed with just having epilepsy. So the epilepsy started like around five years old. And then his clinical diagnosis uh, was several years after that because he was just not only was he having seizures, but he was also losing his ability to walk. He was falling down. He was not being able to see. It took him a long time to get sentences out. And, and these other things just were not consistent with just epilepsy. So we were very, very worried that something else was going on. And you go through the rigmarole of like, well, give him some eyeglasses. You know, maybe the, the focus of the eyeglasses will pull his, his eyes and, you know, make him see better. That didn't work. Well, maybe he just needs to eat something different, maybe a different diet and all this other crap that you go through. But uh, nothing worked. So... You get that uh, that diagnosis that was really just the punch to the gut, David, was when you, you, you get that genetic testing and you, he's got Batten disease, CNL8. There's no cure. Uh, there's nothing we can do for him. You might as well just uh, take him home and live your best life because there's no way he's getting out of this alive. And uh, that was very true, you know, back in, in, in 2010 to 2012. You know, you just – 
you were devastated. You know, they, they, there was nothing going on or so that I knew because I didn't know anything about it. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was the, that was the, the changer, the game changes like, holy shit. So now we, here's the clock. The clock is ticking. And when is he going to die? Because when you start doing your research and you become this WebMD guy, it's not pretty out there. It's just horrifying stories of kids in, in Baton disease land, as I call it. And it's not, a, it's not a great life and it's a horrible death and it just destroys you emotionally. So, yeah, it was, it was an awful day. So if I can paraphrase what you've said, you went from knowing that he has epilepsy and some other things but not knowing what those other things represented to getting the diagnosis of Batten disease, CLN8, and then having a crystal clear or a better understanding about what the situation is, which, you know, it sounds devastating, right? Uh, because the life expectancy for somebody with Batten disease is, what's the range? On the low end, on the high end, I don't mean to be too morbid, but um, just to be real. Well, yeah, it's There's nothing wrong with it being more. A lot of people don't know. I mean, um, you know, we were told, you know, he may live into his early teens or he may not, you know, and, uh, you know, they're saying that these children that, that are diagnosed early, like, you know, in the ages of like one to two to three years old, they don't live past, you know, 10, 11, their life expectancy is uh, really bad. And so they, they, they said that because Sebastian was diagnosed so late, you know, late infantile, he may have a chance to get past his teenage years, but that's, you know, the data wasn't there. And so they gave us a couple of, uh, do death dates that he's actually surpassed. So they didn't know. They didn't know everything. They were just going off previous data. You know, CNL8 in this category of Batten disease is basically very rare in Batten disease land. And there's not many of the eights. There's, there's a predominantly, there's a lot more cases of CNL1. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's my dog. Sophia. Sophia doing her job chasing the squirrels. I apologize. Or protecting the neighborhood, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you have a lot more of cases in children suffering from CNL 1, 2, and 3, and 6, as you do in the, 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 the upper numbers, as you will. So there was a lot more research, a lot more studies, and a few treatments coming out. So it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't that they... <sighs> You know, it's like you, you don't want to cover your ass all day. You, you, the doctors never give you any hope. They just tell you the grim, and if you, you happen to survive, great, you know? And that's what we're doing. We're surviving. We're, uh, we're beating the odds, as they say. And I, I, I hold that because, of, you know, Sebastian. Sebastian's one tough cookie. He's got a resilience. He doesn't let this disease define him, and he doesn't give in. He's a fighter, and he just doesn't care. But the most amazing part about this kid is that he cares about the other children around him that are also suffering some some sort of disability. Like he's in a classroom with other children and he always, and I see him because I go, I sometimes go into the school and, and, and basically he's just taking care of them. <laughs> he wants to talk to them. He doesn't want his schoolwork. He doesn't want to talk to the teacher. He wants to talk to them. He wants to take care of them. Hell, get down and give him a hug and give him a pat on the back. And, you know, it's incredible that the kid that has, you know, all these challenges, all these things going wrong with him. I mean, he can't see, he can't really walk all that great, and he can't really say much, and he's just here, and then he's, like, helping others. He's helping others, you know, in their daily life. And I know what you're thinking. It's like, how does he do that when he's, you know, suffering from something so fatal? And I don't know. I don't know why he does that, but it's amazing to watch. He's always asking about somebody else. And he wants to know how you're doing and what you're doing and when you're doing it. He's very curious. And like I said, he just celebrated 18 years of life and he's not supposed to be here. So the only thing I can come up with, David, he's got a resilience to live and fight this disease. He's got two parents, even though we're, we're, we're broken up, who are still fighting for his life and doing great things for him and others. But also... Got to be said, he's the only child so far that has a split mutated gene of the CNL8. He's the only child on record so far. So 
Maybe this is why he's not as bad as some of these other kids in the CNL8 family. Maybe this is why he's still able to, to talk better, walk better, eat on his own, you know, which sucks. But if you look at these other kids, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty fortunate to have what we have. As they say, it could always be worse. And we're always cognizant of that when we talk to other families and stuff like that. So it's a really weird place to be in, you know, David. It's a really weird place to be in. I'm just grateful. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Sebastian sounds like a very capable young man, and it is an unusual situation where you have somebody with a fatal diagnosis, like you've described, you know, who is able to somehow think about other people and not dwell on his own mortality. And a thought that comes to mind, uh, there's a very good friend of mine, his name is Johnny Emmerman. And when Johnny was going through testicular cancer treatment for the second time in his early 30s, he decided while he was still in the hospital to go to the pediatric cancer ward just to get his mind off of his own situation, right? And it was such a profound experience. He recruits some of his fellow cancer patients to volunteer alongside him, right, with these little kids with you know pediatric cancer. And that morphed into what's turned out to be a life calling of his, which was to create something called Emmerman Angels, which is one of the most well-respected peer-to-peer cancer support organizations in the country. And they've recruited over 8,500 cancer survivors to mentor the cancer fighters. And they've matched them, no exaggeration, more than 50,000 times, right? So it's really uh, a beautiful situation that was birthed out of this how do I deal with my own challenges by keeping my mind healthy and, you know, thinking about others, right? And I think that maybe that was a gift that Johnny had. That's a gift that Sebastian has. It's not something you can tell somebody. It's not something you can teach somebody, right? It's just, it's their gift coming out, if you will. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Was there some meaningful advice that you got that helped you put this circumstance into perspective that's helped put you on a better path? let's see i met i met this one lady who's quite well known in baton disease land Kristen gray who told me because two of her daughters are suffering from this this horrible disease they have baton disease cln6 and she said you know you have to be patient you can't you can't she said you can't hurry up science you just got to be patient and in the meantime you got to keep your kids moving and keep them healthy. And you've got to treat yourself as if this is the last day you're ever going to have. So make it the best. And uh, I really took that advice. It's like, oh, shit, this is really happening. We're really here. And I'm watching this woman do it. And I'm like, holy crap. All right. And it's what I did. You know, I, it's like I didn't take them to Disneyland every day and that kind of crap. I was just, I was like, I'm going to be present. And that's, that's me. I, I am a stay at home father. I am present every day for him, taking care of him, doing what I need to do for him all the time. We have a team of people at the house as well as at uh, the school. And that's because we just kept advocating and kept asking and kept pushing. Because if you know anything about rare disease parents, we're very tired because we're doing everything all day, every day for the child. And then, and then there's the whole aspect of raising your other child if you have siblings who are, you know, healthy, right? I have a 16-year-old son named Gage. So there's that who lives with me full time. So there's always that, that you're always doing something. And um, I just never forgot that, you know, it's like just be present. Just, you know, and I, and I take, I, I honestly, I, I think I have an upper hand on a lot of people in rare disease because I have this group called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, and I think that the, the men and women in that group for the last 26 years have taught me more about life than if I didn't have this group. You know, they say, just show up, suit up and show up, sit down, shut up, listen, <laughs> do what we say, not as we do, and just follow the program, man. Just stay sober one more day. And so I, I take that. It's like, just stay present one more day. You know, I, I joke about this a lot, but it's true. You know, when, when you get this, these horrible diagnoses, you know, moms freak out and dads check out. It's true. There's not a whole lot of dads around, you know, and these mothers, God bless them. You know, they don't have a whole lot of help, you know, so we have to do something.
I'm glad we're talking because this is, this is me doing something. And it's not me telling you, oh, I need help. Well, yeah, we all need help. You know, we love donations. We love mentorship. We love, you know, doing the stuff that makes our children happy. But what we're doing right here, Dave, is like it's, it's just so – I think it's much more needed. And it's called Connections. You know, my, my podcast, Connections with Purpose, was started based on that because I needed something. I needed you. I needed you guys to listen. I needed you to hear me. And, and Project Sebastian was created out of like this horrible situation. And I'm really proud to tell you that Project Sebastian is still here. A lot of foundations don't last two, three years. Nonprofits, they fail all the time. I don't know why or how I'm still here, but it's because I just try to keep it as fresh. So we're out of that, that business of, of like, you know, raising money for cures and stuff like that. I'm going to let that to the big guys. So Project Sebastian is pivoting into a brand new space. We'll get to that Project Sebastian in a moment, but you touched a, an antenna when you made reference to your younger son, Gage. And I'm sort of curious to know what impact Sebastian's situation has had on his younger brother or the extended family for that matter. <laughs> Well, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> In short, it, it affects the family. Uh, absolutely. From everybody involved, from grandparents, parents, siblings, sisters, brothers, cousins, nieces, nephews, even the neighbor. This, this, this is an infection of a, a ripple effect of either just terror, fear, sadness, joy, anger, resentment. And, and, and I'm saying all these things because I'm talking about my son. You know, we've had long discussions about how he feels about his brother. And he's, A, he says, this sucks. I don't want this for him. I don't want this for anyone. And he feels horrible. And he is very cognizant of that his presence alone makes his brother feel good. So Gage has that ability, like his brother, to care about others. And I have no idea where he got these things from because if he knew me back then, I didn't. I was very self-centered. So <laughs> he's got a special relationship. You know, even you can say that they were best friends, but then when the diagnosis really started to present itself, you know, it was really hard to be around him, you know. So that friendship kind of like suffered a little bit. And it hasn't only been until like a couple years that Gage realized that this is really, you know, this is really who he is. And so he's really made time just to be with him and to accept it. But ultimately, I think, as anybody else would say, he's, he's sad, he's angry, he's resentful at something or someone, of course, you know. But he's here. He's, he checks in with Sebastian every day, you know, and they have these long conversations. I just, we would just went to Hawaii. And, you know, the, the old beds where they're, they're, they're kind of like they meet at an intersection, the corner beds. So you got one head here, one head here, and all they did was talk all night like they were five again. It was, it was really cool to see. You know, you got 16-year-old and an 18-year-old talking like they're like on a sleepover. It was cool. Yeah, well, it's refreshing to hear that while there's some challenges and a lot of uncertainty like you've described, that they've been able to maintain their brotherly relationship at the level they have. All right, that's got to mean a lot to you as a dad too. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's just ever-evolving. You know, I think you have to, you have to just adapt. You really do because, you know, you don't know how long we have, you know, especially with your children who are suffering this horrible disease. You don't know how long they're going to be here for. I mean, so, you know, being, being mindful and being present, you know, that's the thing I want to try to create. I want to try to create a whole new infectious type of disease. There's an infection or what I think of as an affliction because like a disease or infection has sort of a negative connotation, but an affliction doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. So <laughs> I think you're onto something there. I'm thinking of supporting organizations, and I'm curious to know what organizations has Sebastian relied on or has your family relied on for Sebastian's benefit? The first thing I always talk about is going to government, the good kind of government. Let's... <laughs> Let's not get it crossed. And the good government is the you know your SSI, your SDI, your local regional center that has laid out a great plan of care for your disabled child or your rare disease child or even special needs child. So we rely heavily on our our LA our North LA County Regional Center that has provided us free of charge in home nursing where LVN comes to the house. 
and is able to maintain or shadow Sebastian so that uh, that we as a family can do other things or help the other child or even make a few bucks here and there, or maybe go to work, that yeah. kind of stuff, which is very rare in this world. <laughs> other than that, we have relied on outside patient services, such as some local businesses where we do physical therapies that have actually maintained some of the, the, the longevity in Sebastian's ability to walk and run to keep his body as fit as possible, as healthy as possible. And I often joke about this, but it's true. We, we treat Sebastian like the number one round draft pick going to the NFL. We have a nutritional program. We have trainers. We have support system. We have mental health providers. We have everything that is possibly able to him, predominantly free of charge most of the time. You know, some of these services cost a lot of money, but, you know, the heavy lifting is done by your state officials, which is what we pay our taxes into. So you just have to to, to, to research that. And I, I think you have a f- couple of friends, David, that are in that side that actually showed me a couple of things or two of when we first met. So yeah, you just have to research and ask about it, but uh, we're very blessed. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing about the local government programs and information that's available. I'm wondering if there's any other organizations. You know, when you, when you get into this, this, this community of your, you know, your rare disease, you, you find other like-minded individuals or families or parents that are suffering from it. And we found a lot of information from the, the, the Batten Disease Research Association, the BDSRA here in North, North America. They've been a tremendous source of information and help just to kind of guide you through you know, the questions and the fears. And they also offer financial support in certain situations. And they also have a family annual conference where everybody comes together and shares their story and we get to meet them. So, you know, the people that you meet online, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, actually real people, you know, so and they're, they're, you're able to share your stories and your hugs and your tears. And there's a weekend full of like doctors giving, uh, you know, updates on current trials and treatments and stuff like that. And there's a, a sister organization in, in Europe called the BDFA, B, yeah, BDFA, yes. I think there's another one in Australia, and, but what really started it all was that, that one family, that, that lady, Kristen Gray, you know, with, with the organization that, that she started for her two daughters, the, the uh, Charlotte and Greneth Gray Foundation, I'm sorry. And that was the lady that really put it into perspective. Go to work, Chris. That's what she said. Go to work. And, and that's what we did. You know, we went to work. We, we started a, a foundation and started raising money and awareness, you know. So those three entities really, you know, were like, lifesavers. They got me out of myself and they got me into some action and they got me into some real information. So, you know, serious, truthful information about this disease, you know, but unfortunately there is no cure yet. And only treatments to either prolong some, some decent life or the inevitable will come. But, you know, having someone on the other end of that phone that's knee deep in the same stuff as you is the connection that with that, that I was so craving. So, yeah, check those three out. They're, they're, they're amazing, amazing organizations. Well, thanks for sharing. And I'm not blind to the fact that both you and Teresa have uh, made your own efforts. And you in the name of Project Sebastian. So let's talk about that. When did that start and how did that evolve? Project Sebastian was created in 2010. I was going to cure epilepsy. <laughs> so That's because that's what you right, knew he had. Right, right? He that's had what epilepsy. we had. And, and I was going to cure him with, with medical cannabis. And so I created a company called Sequoia CBD. And we had botanists and we had science guys. And then we partnered with UCLA. And we were in a off-book test and study where we were working on Dravet syndrome and then Sebastian. So we had the worst kind of epileptic seizures to like Sebastian. We was having like one or two a month. And it was very successful, and then it wasn't. As the laws changed and the people got greedy, everybody had to bail, and we lost everything. So in, during that time, in 2012, we, created, we repurposed Project Sebastian in the medical research for our EIN to have just medical research. So then we basically said, we're going to cure Batten disease. So that first month was the Batten Project Sebastian was for Batten disease research, and um, just this year, we decided to pivot out of that into rare disease as a whole. So yeah. 
it's evolved. That's what I hear you saying. Just like this disease. <laughs> yeah, which is not like a lot of other situations, whether they be for profit or not for profit. And did you start writing initially? Was there a blog before the podcast or what Damn, was the sequence of David going deep into the research. Yes, I had a blog. I had a blog. Somebody told me to go on Tumblr and start just writing my, my feelings and my stories and my thoughts and my fears. And one thing I loved about myself is I love writing. I love writing stories. And I have like tons of journals that I need to publish. I thank you for reminding me. And it's just one of those things where it just feels good for me to put the pen to paper. That's my therapy to where, you know, because nobody's listening. That was my whole MO. You're not listening. So I'm just going to write it. And that just became a couple of articles here and there. And, and someone told me to post it onto LinkedIn. And then they said, you should create a website and Twitter and, you know, Facebook. And so it's just kind of evolved into this social media machine, but you know, it's really tough to keep up with everything, but that, that site Tumblr is no longer, I don't really contribute to that. I usually just, I, I push out a couple of articles here and there when I get really upset to LinkedIn, whether it's about rare disease or mental <laughs> health and, you know, but yeah, I, I really enjoy writing. So. Well, thanks for sharing. And I'm sort of curious to know, what was the name of the podcast? Was it Connections with a Purpose? Well, it's still there. It's still okay. there. And <laughs> my new friend, Effie, tells me I should dust off the old microphone and get behind the mic again because, you know, I had, I had, I had a podcast for over two years as well. At first, it was called the Project Sebastian Podcast, where we interviewed families and doctors and friends and talked about, you know, this horrible disease called Batten disease. And it kind of just, you know, evolved into people talking about rare disease and, and people talking about, you know, business and rare disease and, you know, doctors coming on about different types of things. And, and then I needed to create a business at home because I just couldn't make any money. So I created a company called Consulting with CSG for Addiction and Recovery. And so I said, well, I have a podcast about that because everybody has a podcast, even me. And so uh, I just kind of like hung up the microphone on Project Sebastian and we created Connections with Purpose and we just started talking to everybody about what your connections were and what your purpose was. And that lasted, you know, some pretty good episodes. And then I just kind of got burnt out. And I haven't recorded a podcast since January of this year. And that was the <laughs> I didn't even put that out. I don't even think I published it. It was about, we're going to make some new changes around here. And Project Smash is now this podcast. And we're going to talk about this. I'm like, I'm vomiting in my mouth. It's just ridiculous. And I just... You know, I got really burnt out. I got really burnt out, David. I just, you know, I don't know if you can understand this, but I just, you're constantly battling something you can't win. And you just, sometimes you give up, you lose hope, you just check out. And they call that rare disease burnout. So <laughs> I'm talking to this other woman from Neurogene, Gay Grossman, who's amazing. And she tells me, you know, it's normal. It's normal. You should, you should call these people. I know them personally. And she gave me like this email, like these 10 men and women. And one of them was Effie. And, you know, if you don't know Effie, who's got her own podcast called Once Upon a Gene, she's got this amazing kid named Ford with just a number for disease because uh, that is so rare. And wow, man, what a breath of fresh air. She's been such an inspiration that she just told me to start connecting with these people again and just kind of go around and talk about it and just get back into it. And she was, but we're going to start with my podcast. <laughs> so I just, I found my legs again. And she was like, you better start that podcast. You better start that. I've listened to some of your episodes. You've got something going on. You better do it. And so she kind of put the fire back in me. And then all of a sudden, David, David calls me. Hi, David. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> Yeah, well, Effie is a really special person, and yeah. you know, it's not lost on me. She's a super young mom with a super young. Yeah. Obviously, it's part of her therapy as well, yeah. but she's making a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, and she's really a, a spark plug in that regard. Yeah, yeah, she made a difference in my life. That's for sure. Amazing, and I think she just won Podcast of the Year too on one of these award shows. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So I'm thinking about advice. And I'm wondering if there's any advice that you can offer a dad, not necessarily a rare disease dad, but a dad who's raising a child with differences to help him focus. Oh, man, many things come to mind, but there's one thing that's, that's really missing, which I'm going to be changing here about myself because I was suffering from this. And it's just stop checking out. Start checking in. 
start being a part of groups, start connecting with these moms and dads in rare disease. It doesn't necessarily have to be your rare disease, but it just happens to be in the, in the same scope of finding other men and women to connect to that actually are going through maybe not the same thing physically, but the same thing emotionally. Rare disease is horrible. It sucks. And if you don't have a support system, you find yourself, you know, you know, checking out. Like you maybe get burnt out, you start drinking, start drugging, you start falling off the planet, you stop being present, and then really stuff really starts getting haywire. So the number one thing I would say is to connect with other rare disease families, introduce yourself, extend the hand, and you may not be welcomed at first because people may think you're weird, but that's okay. And there'll be someone that will receive your call and understand that, God, I needed to talk to this stranger because this guy gets me more than my own family who hates me. And that's, that's what's happening. That's the truth, too. So connect with others, for sure. Great advice. I love that phrase that you've used a couple of times. Stop checking out and to check in. It's really clear. I'm sort of curious to know, why is it you've agreed to be a mentor father as part of the Special Fathers Network? Well, because I... I I, I feel that that was missing, you know, that was something that was missing. You know, I, in my other life, my other 12 step life, I, I sponsor guys. That's kind of a mentor, but I didn't know that it would translate into rare disease and helping other men and women, but I'm finding that that's what is really, you know, it's important. And I think it's, it's, it's overlooked and I think it's underprovided. And when I, when I found out about, about you guys, I was just like so excited. Like, wow, there's a dad's group dedicated to helping other men. I want in. It's hard to find us. And I've been on a few of your, of your Zoom calls and, and looking at these guys on the screen and like, wow, that disease, that disease, that disease. I mean, there's a whole like mixture of guys, you know, going through some shit. But the one thing that they're all connecting about is their emotions and their challenges and their their uh, their gratitude is amazing and it's like i didn't know anybody else felt like that that's that's i want to be that guy so you know that's why uh, that's the answer david if that makes sense yeah well we're thrilled to have you thank you for being part of the network is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up yes i'd like i'd like to just make an announcement if i could about project sebastian sure all right so well, like I said, we're we're transitioning into a lot a lot of different stuff. We're trying to help everybody in rare disease, and the one thing that we feel that is falling short is 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 this aspect that what David and I are doing. This type of therapy, these connections, as they would say, we want to really expand on them. So Project Sebastian is going to start offering group therapy sessions. Right now on Zoom, of course, we're trying to set that up and we're going to have it open to everybody in the world that's suffering from a rare disease or an illness, whether you're an adult or whether you have children, we want you to connect with these other families. You know, right now we're also working out a deal to have in-person meetings once a week out here in Valencia at a church to where we basically you can come in and you can talk to other rare disease family about any topic that you want to talk about. And I think that that is something that is going to really be useful because it's useful to me and I'm sure David can relate that to where we all have to help each other and a lot of us don't understand how to get the help or where to get the help but sometimes we just only want to be heard or to throw up on somebody or to hug somebody and just to simply say I get that guy I understand that gal wow I felt like that too and keep coming back as they say because you know the secret is always the next meeting. So that's what we're going to start doing. We think that it's a great niche for us at Project Sebastian to where we can offer a, a group type of community support. I love it. Let's make it a point, Chris, to circle back a couple years down the road and um, get an update <laughs> on that vision that you've just shared. Let's also give a special shout out to uh, Effie Parks for helping connect us. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Effie. And thank you, David. You guys are awesome. If somebody wants to learn more about Project Sebastian or contact you, what's the best way to do that? I'm an open book. People don't like it. People are trying to protect me, but I don't care. So you can reach me at projectsebastian.org is the website. Email me at info at projectsebastian.org. 
My phone number is 661-414-4856. I, uh, the office currently is at 25688 Alicante Drive in the city of Valencia, California, otherwise known as <laughs> Awesome Town. And feel free to stop by. Feel free to call me. Just do something, as we say now. You know, that guy, Andrew Shu had it down, and I couldn't stand that guy years ago. But it's true. Let's do something. Let's make a difference. Seriously, let's do something. Yeah, well, we'll be sure to include all that in the show notes so it'll make it as easy as possible for somebody to reach you. Chris, thanks again for your time and many insights. As a reminder, Chris is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Chris, thanks again. You're welcome, David. We appreciate you. And uh, if you ever need anything, I'm always here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Also, please be sure to register for the Special Fathers Network bi-weekly Zoom calls held on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.